Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to The Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. My guest today was once a singer, a music teacher, and a nanny who was once afraid of entrepreneurship and is now the CEO of NUMA, an accelerator helping build the next generation of entrepreneurs and leaders. Today, she is an entrepreneur. She's a powerhouse of energy. Please welcome Francis Simowitz. Welcome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm very excited to have you on. I love that you said that you're a powerhouse of energy because you are definitely, um, as you described to me, a small package, but <laughs> bring out so much energy. And I've had the the privilege to experience some of that through our, our conversations before we even got rolling just now. Um, something that I like to do for our entrepreneurs and business leaders is link our childhood and the experiences from our childhood to where we are today and maybe what they how they impacted us. So I'd love to hear about your upbringing, um, what you learned from your childhood, and how that might have impacted some of the career choices that you've made today. Yeah. Um, so I definitely had a interesting childhood. Um, my mom had me at 18. So she was a baby having a baby. Um, I grew up with my grandparents and my mother. Uh, my father was not necessarily in the picture. And I had a couple of formative experiences growing up as well um, that kind of taught me resilience and kind of got me over fears of changing, which I think is a, a thing that a lot of people are afraid of and mm -hmm. is something that entrepreneurs especially need to constantly push through. Um, so when I was in elementary school, I went to Catholic school and I was bullied mercilessly. It was horrible. I was like beat up on the bus. I was made fun of in the schoolyard. I was like, Definitely not the cool kid. And I was in therapy at like sixth grade because it was, you know, obviously as a bullied child, very depressing. And I ended up kind of pushing forward with my therapist, my mother, to make a change to a different school. Because I was in choir and in choir, I had friends. I had people that liked me and I was like, you know what? I think that it might not be something inherently wrong with me. It might be my situation. And I got to this point where I was like, I'm more afraid of staying where I am than making a change. And so I was able to change to public school. Mm -hmm. And it was like my first lesson where I realized that if you push forward for change, that it can get better. And in middle school, then afterwards, I had amazing friends and I had a boyfriend for the first time and all of these things. And so it was my first real lesson where change is possible and it's actually better. And so being afraid of the unknown is something always to fight. Yeah. I, I wonder um, when you were being bullied, what what was the reason for the bullying? Do you, do you remember at all? Because I think sometimes just being a little bit different gets you bullied. And so I'm just wondering with your... Yeah. I mean, it was all sorts of stuff. You know, it's like I started on the bus with these two boys and they would make fun of me because I was very skinny and small. Mm. And I think I was just easy. I was an easy target, um, which then spread to like the playground because then other kids saw that I was being bullied. And then I was just the easy target there mm -hmm. um, until it was like literally the whole school. And I'd be walking around just praying that somebody would that no one would notice me. Wow. Wow. And so it sounds like you were the one that that engaged with your parents and with your with your school to change to make that change yeah with my mother and with the school and with my mom convincing my grandmother it would also be okay and you were very young so what was because I, I would assume that most kids at that age would just I guess like you said deal with it and just hope that they're not seen and just what what did you, how, how did you decide that you're going to bring this up to, to the school and to your parents? How did, how did that happen? Because I would assume that when we think about entrepreneurship, the link to me there is that a lot of entrepreneurs are kind of in the closet, like they're scared and they, they have this feeling of, of rejection where they get fired from jobs and they don't know why they can't be, they, they can't be managed and they don't understand why. And, and they kind of get bullied in the corporate world because they just don't fit in. And so there has to be a moment where that entrepreneur says, I've had enough and I want to break free and do something different. Yeah. And so that mindset that you had as a child is what I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah. 
It was, honestly, it was being able to see the difference between what my life was like in choir uh, versus the life I had at mm. school. Because in choir, I had something different to offer. I, you know, could sing and I was part of a community. I was right. part of a community of people that were then creating something beautiful together, which I think a lot of what I do now is also that. And like what I originally loved about music, I find in my work today. Mm-hmm. And that was so good that I needed to fight for that. I needed Mm -hmm. to fight for what could be better. And, you know, I think uh, with entrepreneurship, as you're saying, a lot of people are afraid to take that step. They're afraid to take that change. They're afraid to leave their job that makes them unhappy because the unknown is oftentimes scarier Mm -hmm. than kind of, uh, what is it? You're the devil, you know, is better than the devil you don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I've in multiple times in my life, I've gotten to points where stagnating or staying where I am is scarier than trying to go into the unknown and Mm -hmm. like getting yourself into that mindset. And like, I'm really glad that I've had those formative experiences because it was the first time I really learned that lesson. Yeah. And, and like you said, the choir offered that contrast for you where you were able to see a little bit. And I guess that, you know, as a, as a child and children out there um, that might be suffering from this, if you can offer them some of that contrast of maybe a team sport or a different activity outside of the school or wherever they are, that maybe they're uncomfortable so that they could see that there's a better, a better way. And, and that's what the choir offered to you. That's Yeah. I mean, communities, I mean, even if you're thinking about entrepreneurship, go find your local tech ecosystem and mm-hmm. your entrepreneur community. Um, There's online communities for things like that. I think it's really about the people connection um, and and being able to have those other viewpoints and and finding your people and finding, you know, everyone has different skill sets and things about them that are valuable. Mm-hmm. If you're unhappy in your job, you just might be in the wrong place. Right. And and that's and it's funny because that's what you offer today is you offer that you offer <laughs> you offer that to to the the entrepreneurs out there through your accelerator. Uh, so you go to this new school and um, you're on your way to be a singer and a music <laughs> teacher. So tell us about that journey and and then the the shift in there and I can't wait to hear about the playground. Yes. So I fell in love with music. Obviously, music was a thing that kind of saved my life in a way. Um, And, you know, through middle school and then I went to high school, like music became the center of everything. Um, I also, you know, in high school suffered and was hospitalized um, a few times with an eating disorder as well. And music, again, was this this really important healing thing. It also gave me a focus. Um, And so for me, I was extremely goal oriented in music. Like I wanted every solo. I would push myself even when I was afraid to get up and sing. I knew that if I was ever going to be successful at it, that I had to, again, push through my fear and get up and try for every single solo. So I always tried out for every solo. I competed for um, like the state and local competitions to get into the uh, elite choirs in which I accomplished all of that. And then my dream was to go to Westminster Choir College, which was one of the top schools in the U.S. for music education. Mm. It was what I wanted to do. So I got to college and I realized probably in my junior year uh, that I didn't want to do music anymore. I really had loved kind of the goal orientedness of it. But when you continue to pursue on this path, kind of the pinnacle for performance Mm -hmm. is a solo career. And I found that a lot of the things that I had originally loved about choir, which was community, like creating something beautiful with a number of people, wasn't there. There was a lot of like ego, kind of the mentality of my success means your failure. Mm. And I fell out of love with that aspect of it. And so I spent a couple of years then being a little bit lost. Because I had spent my entire life, like since I was five, dancing around my grandmother's living room to ABBA, uh, wanting to be a singer. It was like, and I I remember being younger and being like, oh, I'm so lucky. I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, (laughs) Which was, then I was like, oh, wait, I don't know what I want to do with my life at all. Um, And so I spent a couple of years uh, nannying. And I was going to be the best nanny that there ever was. Like, no matter what I'm doing, I'm, like, very convinced I'm going to do the best at it. I used to pretend in my head that there would be, like, these nanny awards that I was going to win <laughs> for being just, like, an awesome nanny. And I loved the kids. They were great. 
Um, but I got to this point, like three years, I was it was grueling. I would commute two hours every day to the Upper West Side from Long Island and two hours back. And it would be sometimes a 10 hour or more work day with the children. And I loved these little kids. But I got to a point where I was like, I have this impact on these three little kids and I love them, but I want to impact more people. And I would spend a lot of time on the trains back and forth from work looking at what are could be other potential career options. I was looking at marketing as an option. I was looking at, um, <laughs> I was looking at also like physics, which is not a thing that I should be doing. Um, <laughs> I'm not a math science person. Uh, and I had a moment where I was on the playground with the kids and I realized, I was like, oh, I can do anything that I want to do. Like the world is a playground and I'm finally big enough to play on the big kid stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was just, again, like one of those moments where I was like, I can make a change. I mm -hmm. have the power to do so. I've done that before and I can choose my path. And so I ended up, uh, my, my ex-husband at the time, uh, he worked at a startup and I loved the culture that they had there. It was collaborative. They were excited. They liked to work together. They were creating something really interesting and cool. And I was like, I want that. And in a lot of ways, like there's a lot of parallels to what I loved about choir and music mm -hmm. in the tech and startup world when you think about creating collaboratively something right. awesome. Right. Uh, and so I went to a boot camp called Startup Institute, which mm -hmm. no longer exists. Sadly, they're dead. But there are other boot camps like this out there that um, got in eight weeks, got me skills in marketing and a network uh, to help me get my first job in tech and startups. And that was how I transitioned from being a nanny <laughs> to start my journey in entrepreneurship. I want to learn a little bit more about the startup boot camp uh, before we go into the entrepreneur part. Uh, but a couple things. Um, one, What's interesting about what you said about wanting to be a singer, I have two daughters, um, one who's six, that's Denise, and then one who's four, and that's Tenley. And Tenley, since she can talk in full sentences, let's say, because she's been able to talk for a while, um, says, I want to be a singer. And she always says that. And she's yeah. always singing. She wakes up in the morning singing. So I, I, I was very inspired to meet you. <laughs> and now I'm scared. <laughs> so, so that's one. That's, that's just a side note. Yep. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But um, if, if her future is anything like yours, then uh, we're going to be OK. Yeah. Um, the other question I have for you is you mentioned on those train rides that you would read a lot. And I'm just interested into what kind of books you would read and uh, which ones had a really big impact on you today. Yeah. Um, I probably don't remember the titles of them anymore. Yeah, that's they, okay. I literally would like... Themes. Yeah, themes. A lot of them would be like literally on specific career topics. Like mm -hmm. I'd be like, maybe... Because like a subset of marketing is community management. And actually, that's kind of actually what I do today. But mm -hmm. I remember getting a book about community management and marketing to like understand... What were the topics? Like, what do people do day to day? Like, what are these careers actually like? How much math does it actually entail? Mm. Um, because I really wanted to find something that would be more versatile because I felt like I was very pigeonholed with my like very expensive bachelor degree in music. Um, <laughs> thank you, student loan debt. Um, but you know, there was like one thing I could do with that degree, maybe two, um, where I wanted something that was going to allow me more freedom and flexibility mm -hmm. to kind of find different paths and kind of see where I actually ended up and it be and it be relevant. So um, I was also looking into um, physics and there was a book by Brian Green uh, that was on uh, theoretical physics, which I thought was really interesting because uh, that was one path that I was like, that would be really cool. Like, I want to work on figuring out string theory, but <laughs> oh, not <goodness>. really. <laughs> uh, Michu, Michu uh, I can't think of his last name. He he talks about that. He's he's very good. He's a physicist. Uh, yeah. Michu Kachu, Kuchu? I th I can't Maybe, think. yeah. Anyway. I, it's very interesting. I just I was hoping well, you'd would, save me, I but would, no, that's okay. <laughs> and I would skip over the math parts of the book, so that's all I knew it was not for me. <laughs> 
Um, in that experience with the books, which I think is very important for um, our entrepreneurs and and our business leaders out there, and uh, as I as I've said to you, and, and I always say on the show, is the the entrepreneurs are those like the solopreneurs, the yep. small business owners, those who are. St- pretty much blazing their own path and trying to figure out their way. And they could be anywhere from, like I said, a solopreneur to one in a tech startup like yours, where they have 15, 20, 100 employees, right? And then we have our business leaders who I identify as our uh, corporate environment, where they're maybe coming in as an entry level and climbing the ladder up to the C-suite and trying to learn different things from your stories here. And I think that they both can learn a lot from from the books that you may have read or just from the experience that you had with the books that you have read, uh, which is... These these books, they, they provide, like you said, a day in the life for these people. So I think the biographies of people that you aspire to be like yep. are really great to read. Yep. I think, like you said, the management books of understanding what it encompasses to know that physics is not the route for me <laughs> um, are really good ways uh, to use your time rather than playing with social media or anything like oh, that. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really great books, especially on entrepreneurship. I recommend um, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Oh my God, Lean Ben Horowitz. Startup, yeah, ben Horowitz. Lean, yeah. um, Lean Startup's a great one. Um, my favorite management book is Radical Candor. Uh, I love a lot of what they talk about in terms of like feedback culture and um, you know how to best support your teams. Like I, I recently did like one of the exercises in the book on like career path planning with my reports. And it was like a really great exercise for the team. And so like, yes, there's a, and also it's kind of controversial because not everybody likes him. I love Elon Musk's bi- biography mm-hmm. um, only because he, he, he thinks about really big problems mm-hmm. that a lot of times like entrepreneurs or even, I mean, this is me as well. We're thinking about kind of like, what can I directly impact right now? He's thinking about how do we get to Mars, right? Yes. And so it's just like very, uh, he's thinking about like the long-term humanity problems, which mm-hmm. I, I find really interesting about him. Yeah, I, I read his book too. And so just as a disclaimer here, and I think this is good for anybody who's listening. And if you're listening, then this will probably be very good for you is <laughs> I read all of my books through Audible. I, I don't, uh, yeah. uh, I, I'm, uh, some might contradict me on this, but as I'm dyslexic. And so reading is just, the hardest thing in the world. It's it's very, I have to reread pages and it drives me nuts. And so why spend my time trying to do that when I can actually read a book in a couple hours and actually get what I get need to get out of it? Yeah. So that that's how I read. But yeah, uh, Elon Musk, and, and I'm glad you brought him up because um, you work with a lot of tech startups and he works in the tech field. And I think that some of the things that are misunderstood about him are his big thinking and his his way to just say, yeah, we can do that. And there's a couple things that I kind of want to just touch on with that is, which I think is so important for entrepreneurs, that confidence that he has and that like he'll figure out any situation. And you, you've you talked about that too, of like, I need to figure this out and figure out the situation that I'm in. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that, that I, I got from him in his book was, um, oh, it wasn't from his book. I'm sorry. It was from an interview. Ah. It was from an interview where uh, Joe Rogan was interviewing one of his CEOs uh, from uh, one of the companies. I think it was uh, the, for the rocket ship. Because, SpaceX. Yeah, for SpaceX. Yes. And the CEO compared him to Hugh, um, uh, the aviator, Hugh. Uh, anyway, I can't think of his name, but he was a billionaire, eccentric, crazy madman who also very like Elon Musk wanted to do all these crazy things and became very wealthy and rich from it. And he compared him to him and he thought that he was going to, he thought he was insulting Elon by comparing him to this madman. And he was like, oh my goodness, how did I do that? Why did I do that? Ah. (laughs) And Elon's response to him later, later on, wasn't that he related him to a madman. Um, You know, not that I I can't remember his last name is driving me crazy. And anybody on the other end is probably saying, I know exactly his name. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, um, what, what Elon said to him was, it wasn't that you compared me to a madman or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine and all. It's that the things that he created didn't change the world. Mm. And the things that I'm creating are to change the world. And whether Elon, so I think people sometimes take out of context that Elon wants to build, um, be able to live on, on Mars. And what what's taken out of context is that not that he's saying that we need to go live on Mars, but to think big. Yeah. And to think that big, to be able to affect what's happening here on Earth yep. and to affect change here and to do something that actually has an impact yep. on, on our on our world. I mean, all of his projects have impact. I mean, it's it, like one day the Earth will be gone. 
That is a fact. Like, the Earth is not going to be able to live forever. One day, like, the sun's going to become a red giant and swallow up the Earth. So there is, like, a long-term then thinking where it's like one day when humans can no longer inhabit the Earth, mm -hmm. what are we going to do? Like, he, it's survival instincts. It's like right. we're going to go to Mars. And nobody's thinking about that. And, I mean, a lot of global problems, you know, even with what's happening with climate change, we don't want to be addressing it when it's too late. Mm -hmm. So he is trying to change the world. And, like, electric vehicles, like when he had the Hyperloop, like all of these really interesting things that would have positive impact on humanity. So that's why I like Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that that's so important, too, when we're talking about the tech startups of when you think about entrepreneurs who are trying to solve a problem and create something that doesn't exist. And we go back to uh, where they're kind of stuck and they're going, you know, is, is this really important? Should I really share this? And that's where I want to empower them through this of, yeah, you should share it. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm sure if Elon Musk put his hand up or when he did put his hand up in class and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to get us to Mars, everybody probably did laugh at him. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> here he is on a path, right? And everybody still does. Yeah. Um, and in a way, he is kind of bullied uh, to, to the point of people yep. like laughing at him and thinking, but if... If he's trying, at least, it's at least a step closer to some kind of technology or ways to change um, for the better, exactly. I think, for the good. Uh, so anyway, so that there's our, our book theory there. <laughs> That's the book segment. Uh, you can pick those up on audible.com. Um, I don't have I don't have any affiliate with them, but I, I think maybe we'll we'll start that up. Uh, I will put those books in the show notes. Uh, that was Lean Startup, Radical Candor, and then Ben Horowitz, ben Horowitz um, The Hard Things About Hard Things, which is also a really great book. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to more about your career, I want to hear, because I don't know this term, community management, and I'd love to hear what that is and how that works. Yeah, so community management. So like if you think about like subsets of skills, right? So if you like a business needs certain skills, right? Like typically in a, any startup, there's people focused on product, there's people focused on sales, there's people focused on sort of design, and then there's marketing. And within those buckets, there's a lot of skill sets that can be derived from them. So you can be a marketer, but you could be someone that writes blog posts and creates content, and that's also under the umbrella of marketing. You can be someone that uh, focuses on search engine optimization and having you know, the website show up first on mm -hmm. Google searches, and that's an entire job and skill set. So under the umbrella of marketing, there is um, a subset called community management, and it's both like in-person community management and also online community management. So it's people that will actually interact with the community around brands mm. uh, to create content, support, um, facilitate discussions, organize events, things like that. So for me, like that was a very interesting potential career path um, when I was looking at changing careers uh, because it, I think, encompassed a lot of like what I already loved, like a lot of creativity, a lot of connections with people. Mm -hmm. um, I had also taken like personality tests back in the day. So I was like, what do ENFPs <laughs> like want to do with their life? And like <laughs> marketing was also on that list. And so it was, uh, I did a lot of like sort of self-research too to figure out what path to take. I think that that's so important to do that self-research, what you just said there. I've had several entrepreneurs on the show and, and really great leaders. And the w one thing that they all mentioned and one of them really prioritized as number one thing is self-awareness yes. and really, really knowing about yourself. I mean, that's even also really important when you're building teams as an entrepreneur, because you need to know what are the things that you are very good at and what are the things that I am very bad at so that I can hire and bring in other people to collaborate with me to fill in those gaps so that we can kind of be a whole machine. Mm -hmm. It's it's so important to understand your strengths and weaknesses. And what's that test that you took, you said? It was just like the regular like personality test. I think it's mm -hmm. like what the 16 personalities, I forget what it's called exactly, but it's like... Some, there's like INTJs and ENFP. So I'm like extroverted, um, perceiving. It's like a whole thing. And cool. Yeah. I've, I've taken some it's of them the Myers -Briggs. too. It's the Myers-Briggs. It's the Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, Myers-Briggs. I've, I've taken I've taken the Myers-Briggs, I believe. Uh, I know I took another one for for my coach, uh, but I forget I forget the results. But I think yeah. I, I think I know. <laughs> I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so... During this time is when you enrolled in this boot camp, is that right? Or right after the, the big break? Um, so I 
I was nannying up until the last day, and the next Monday I started the boot camp. And you started the boot camp. Uh, so sh- share with us how you found this boot camp. Um, I, I know it's an eight-week program, and yeah. I, and it relates to what you do today. Yeah. Um, is it like – so this boot camp, is it different in the sense that it's more of like a, a trade program or any sort? Is it like a class? Yeah, so it's very alternative education. Like actually at the mm-hmm. time, I was considering if I needed to go back and do more school. And I was like, I'm already in so much student loan debt. Like what if I go get a master's degree in marketing and I hate it and I spent yeah. more money and spent two years of my life on it. So my ex-husband was actually, I think he was at a conference or something and he saw Startup Institute there. And he sent me the link and was like, maybe you want to look into this. Maybe one day you'd want to do this. And I took a look at it and I said, oh no, I want to do that right now. Um, like I'm going to apply and we need to figure out how I can quit my nanny job so that I can do this program because this is what I need to do. And how much was it? It was at the time, it was only like $5,000, mm. which is, it sounds like a lot of money, mm-hmm. but it also is way cheaper than college. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think it's important too, because when you're thinking about entrepreneurship, there's going to be a lot of costs, but yeah, the is. benefits outweigh the cost, yeah. as we'll learn. I got better return on investment from that program than I ever did from my bachelor's degree. Um, and so it was a combination of curriculum. So they had tracks that were skill-based tracks um, across. They had a product track. Um, so like people to, that wanted to learn how to code and be developers. Sales track, mm-hmm. that if you wanted to learn how to sell. Marketing, if you wanted to learn sort of some of it, give you a broad overview of like the skills in marketing. Mm -hmm. And then there was also um, design and product. So if you wanted to be a designer doing like UX and UI um, for like websites and things like Mm -hmm. that. And then all of the sessions weren't taught by like traditional professors. It was people that actually were working in jobs and using these skills every day. So like, for example, I learned how to utilize Google Analytics from somebody that worked on the internal Google Analytics for Google. Mm. So of course, they're an expert. And then outside of that, that allows you also to build your network because you're meeting all of these instructors and mentors that are actually in the field. And it allowed me to like build these relationships to then start networking towards a job. Um, They also had components where um, they had like partner project groups. So they would actually pair us with real startups and put us into groups about four or five across like functions of skill set. So I was in the marketing track, but I had somebody in my group that was like sales, another marketer. We had a designer. We had a developer. And we were given to this startup that partnered with them. And they gave us a project to work on that would be impactful for their business if we could help them figure it out. And actually got to practice our skills then in a real life situation, which helped us A, have like a proof point mm-hmm. towards getting a job. Because a lot of the feedback previous to Startup Institute, I had been trying to like network through my ex-husband's network. And I had this like job interview that I got through like his startup's investor. And they were only, the startup was only taking it as a favor to their investor. And they rescheduled on me like five times. And finally, I had a call with the guy and he was like, you're super resilient. Because like you just like, you were going to meet with me. And he was like, I love your energy. I think you're great, but I don't know if you can do the job. And like, because I didn't have any of the skills necessarily or any of the background or experience to show I could do it, even though I, I mean, I knew I could do it. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so it was great. So it gave me those proof points to be able to actually showcase then in eight weeks that I had a portfolio of work. I had some experience. I had relationships so that I could start actually putting my way forward to getting my first job at a startup. And Mm -hmm. so it was like a super important, pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. Um, It was actually founded by the managing directors of Techstars Boston. So Mm -hmm. it was built on the same model of startup acceleration that Techstar used. But rather than it being for specifically entrepreneurs, it was more for entrepreneurial people that wanted to get jobs in startups. Mm, Yes. So and and that's and that's the big difference there. And then so from that, that brought you into your your next role, which was the nanny service, right? Yeah, Sitter City. I blended my old life with my new. I know. Um, <laughs> I thought that was interesting. That's why I wanted to bring it up. I didn't want to skip over it because yeah. I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, they were. Um, I, and I always tell people that as well because I do a lot of mentoring and coaching for people that are trying to get into the startup world. And when they're trying to figure out how to best position themselves, like if they're coming from corporate or consulting, et cetera, I, I always tell them there are so many startups that are innovating in almost literally every industry. And so finding first an understanding of what are your skill sets already, the things that you are good at, mm-hmm. and then matching that to industries that people are innovating in 
it'll be very easy to then to position yourself as like having the expertise in the story to then go work in that type of company. So with Sitter City, they were a partner company for the Startup Institute Chicago office. So they would do like partner projects and they would commit to like having access to potentially hiring the students coming out of it. And uh, they were looking to hire someone to start their New York office. Um, And so I met with my boss, Andrew, uh, in New York, we had a great conversation because I had just been nannying for years on the Upper West Side. I was like, I know what the nanny community is here. I understand the parents here. I understand the ecosystem. Um, And it really gave me an advantage to land that job. And so I started the New York office. Um, They were working on, like they had been around for a long time. I had actually gotten all of my babysitting and nannying jobs over the years since college on their platform. But they were innovating in the space Mm -hmm. and they were saying, we're going to create an on-demand babysitting service. At the time, it was called Date Night Now, which we rebranded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but it a was a little confusing. A little confusing. You're like, what? <laughs> what is this? Um, but it was it was really cool. And I, I I launched. I was on the operations and marketing team. I launched the operations in New York and onboarded all of the babysitters for this on-demand service and did a lot of marketing with parents and created partnerships. Uh, And then I got to go to Boston as well in D.C. to help launch the operations there before I was like, okay, I'm ready to to move on now to my next thing. But it was like my first real job in the startup space and a a very exciting one. Um, The word launch we use a lot. And I'm interested to hear what your concept of launch is when you're saying you're you're launching these. Because to me, I'm thinking launching. You are like not sleeping, and, <laughs> and responding to multiple emails and coordinating and doing so much. Uh, but that that's from my perspective. I'm interested to hear your perspective of launching all of this stuff and coordinating. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a tiring time. I think that's also why I left at the time that I did because it was kind of lonely. I they were gonna hire more people for the New York office, and they never did. So then it was kind of like me doing all of the things in New York for them for this specific part of the company, the on-demand service, which was really cool, but it was a lot. And so Mm -hmm. there was a lot of events and a lot of just sort of like figuring things out ambiguously Mm -hmm. because I didn't have necessarily somebody in the office next to me to collaborate with and everyone was in Chicago. Um, And then when I went to Boston, I'd be going back and forth for a month or two when I was launching a new city and I'd spend four or five days in the city work for like 10, 13 hours a day because I would have to be like uh, onboarding all of the new sitters to the platform in that location, doing some marketing efforts with parents in that location. And it was exhausting. Um, so it was it was a lot. And then once the city was set up, I could leave. Uh, but that was kind of the the launching process with that company. And I'm, I'm happy you said that because I think sometimes um, entrepreneurship is looked at as very glamorous. And, and although in that moment you weren't an entrepreneur per se in the sense that you are today, um, but you were, you were doing some of the work that you have to do as an entrepreneur and, and launching. Yeah, I always say that people can be entrepreneurial without being entrepreneurs. Right. And so I think like even if you're working in a large corporate company, mm-hmm. you can be entrepreneurial within that world and that ecosystem without mm-hmm. necessarily being a solo entrepreneur. Right, right. And, and what I'm saying there too, and I, and I agree with that 100%, yeah. and, and definitely we, we've had conversations here on the show too where um, in, interpreneurship yeah, is, entrepreneurship. was the word that, that he, he used in my other episode. Yeah, but, um, it, but it is. It is hard work. It's, it, and that's what I wanted yeah. to get at. And and that was that speaks to your resilience that you just talked about with with the interview process is that when they're interviewing someone and this goes into your your interviewing style, too, which is it's not about your background because an Ivy League background, all the the experience and everything is meaningless if you're not persistent in this field yep. and if you're not resilient to be able to work those long hours and to do all that. And you have to really think about that before you take those positions. You do. You really do. I always say that, like, when you because the saying is when when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, which is so not true. <laughs> when you love what you do, you work really, really hard and integrate it fully in your life. Like I don't, I talk a lot about work-life integration, mm-hmm. not work-life balance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you want work-life balance, you can have that, but it's not in entrepreneurship. <laughs> right. Well, Richard Branson talks about it and says work and play come to or work, are together. Yes. He, he looks at them completely together. They're not separate. Yes, and the same thing. I play all day. Yeah. <laughs> I get to be creative all day. <laughs> right. And and you work too, but yeah, they, they, they come together. Yeah. So um, I, I really uh, think that that story catapults you to where you are today because you didn't just move into the CEO suite 
uh, you had to earn that, but you earned it very quickly. And I, I think that quickly. part of that moment right there of that big pivot for you of the boot camp and then this experience of launching and traveling and all this craziness uh, gets you into a position to where you are today. So um, I guess we can fast forward to where you are today and and going to NUMA. And so you, you well, you also did a, a brief stint in the... I actually went back to work at that boot camp. Yes, right. Which was actually like... I have the boot camp's logo tattooed to me. Actually, literally, like my resume is on my body. Um, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> well, let's stay on the tattoos for a second because yeah. you mentioned a very important tattoo. Um, the try the hang on. I I know the word. Well, actually, you tardigrade. You, tardigrade. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I this was actually. It's kind of like my spirit animal. So if you don't know what a tardigrade is, it's like this microscopic creature. Um, sometimes another nickname for them is water bears. And they're one of the most resilient in the universe. Like they can live in the vacuum of space for 10 days with no food, no air, no water and not die. They can be at extreme temperatures and not die. They can be frozen for like decades and not be dead. They can be rehydrated. Um, And so after I got divorced, I took my first um, solo trip to Spain. And it was such an amazing experience. I really connected with myself and kind of my next steps and my future. And my souvenir was my tardigrade tattoo that has a little flamenco flower in his hair, oh, even though cool. they don't have hair. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's like how I, I see myself in life is like I am a, a tardigrade. I'm small and you can't kill me. <laughs> and we've evolved from them. Uh, my my learning oh, on them really? was they were the ones who were able to make it through after the dinosaurs were completely obliterated. Yep. They were one of the microscopic creatures that made it through and survived through all the different uh, errors that our Earth has experienced. Yeah, they're super cool. Yeah, they are. They are very <laughs> cool, and so you can evolve from that as well. But yeah, you're unkillable. I love that. <laughs> I love that. So yeah, so let's so let's go into so yeah, so you went back to the to the boot camp that you, and you worked for them. I worked for them. And what what did you learn from that experience oh, going it. from student to teacher there? It was incredible. Um it was well, it was the first also my foray into sales, which I would say is actually mm. my real skill set. So I did marketing when I went to the boot camp, but I am a salesperson, which is mm. a really important skill set for any CEO as mm. well. Um and I got to further develop my network, but then I also got to be in a position where I got to support other people that were trying to make that same transition and those changes in their life that I made. And it was absolutely a wonderful experience getting to run those programs, getting to sell those programs, getting to work with all of those students. And then it also um, exposed me as well to the back end of you know what accelerators can do as vehicles for education and for change. Uh, and because it changed my life and... That same kind of connections to network and skills, et cetera, I watched change other people's lives. Mm. And I also really loved that. And I fell in love with the accelerator model that supports, you know, obviously I run an accelerator now. That's what my company does. Um, and then I knew that I kind of after that opportunity wanted to continue on that path. And when NUMA came along, because they're headquartered in France, uh, and they were looking to open their New York office. When I received an opportunity through my network, someone pinged me literally on Facebook Messenger being like, hey, I heard you're looking for your next role. Um, I was like, this sounds really cool because it was an opportunity to build a program from scratch. Like I was working at a program that already existed. And now I was like, what would that take to build up the community from scratch, to figure out the value proposition, to do all of that? Um, It was funny because actually when I was interviewing for NUMA, I had three other job offers. I had one out in San Francisco making $35,000 more than the job I took at NUMA at the time. And then I had an also counter offer at my existing job at Startup Institute for another $25,000 more. And I turned both of those down to basically work at the exact same salary that I had (laughs) before leaving um, because I found that that had the biggest opportunity for growth. And I think a lot of people at the time thought I was crazy for turning down larger sums of money. But I knew that like, or I've always operated at the belief that like, if you're doing what you love and you're creating the most interesting opportunities to build and to utilize the things that you love, Mm. the money will eventually come. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you've always been very co- collaborative throughout this whole um, conversation. You've talked a lot about that, that co- collaboration is definitely very important to you. So you are with the founders of New York in New York of, of NUMA, and you're working on building this out. Mm-hmm. And you start off as a project manager? Yeah, I was the program manager. Program so there, manager. Was, there was three roles to start in New York. Um, I was the program manager. There was a program director. And then there was a man, the CEO and managing director of the office um, a, at the time. Mm-hmm. And so what what did you have to do? Um, and you don't have to go not, not day to day do. But what did you have to do in order to get yourself um, prepared for, but also seen um, to become the CEO that you are today? Because you did that in a short amount of time. I did it you in did it in really short two years. Of time. In two years, yeah. So I kind of took the job knowing that the position and title were more junior than all of the other opportunities I had had and that I could actually operate at. And so I wasn't taking the opportunity to just sort of act as a program manager. I was taking the opportunity to create impact and to build. And mm-hmm. so it was kind of more about my mindset around the opportunity from the beginning that I think positioned me very well to quickly advance. Mm-hmm. And so there was another program director who we ended up letting go after about um, six months because he wasn't actually effective in the role. And I had actually brought in like one of the things we needed to do was kind of seed the network so that we would have mentors to actually support the startups. And he got the role saying that he had a very large network, et cetera, and wasn't actually really able to onboard much of the network. And we realized that most of the people that were actually coming on and supporting and being a part of our network were all coming from me. So when we let him go, it was like a very obvious next step for me to become the program director. And so Mm -hmm. I actually launched, uh, we actually almost died after the first six months. Like we were out of the original like loan money from France. And like I ended up selling just enough to keep the business going with like sponsorship from our legal partner. Um, And then we sold our first startup on the program and we had our first startup join us that September and we had a kickoff at Google and then uh, in whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what? A kickoff at Google. A kickoff like, at Google. Like, oh. like a big event, you know? <laughs> so every, so it's just it's like being in Central Park. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was nice that Numa Paris had a brand in Paris because they had connections and they were well known in that ecosystem and they had a big partnership in Paris with Google for Entrepreneurs. So we had already an in with Google. <laughs> okay. And so where was was this in New York? Yeah, or? it was in Google, okay. New York. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was it was a, a, you know very exciting to then you know be able to really kick this off and continue to build and then in january we launched our first like real like full cohort with like four or five companies from around the world that were coming all to new york together for the first time uh, and it was awesome um and so then i continued in that capacity we hired more people uh and then aviva who i absolutely love she's my birthday buddy she's from france we have the exact same birthday it's what's the birthday, birthday next week may 28th oh um we're birthday. the exact same age so she's like my french twin uh she decided to leave new york her boyfriend didn't love new york anymore and uh, was leaving the company actually at the time i was actually interviewing for a big corporation as well because i was thinking about leaving numa Because at the time, they had promoted me to program director. And I mean, we're a startup, but the previous program director was making double my salary. And when they promoted me, I only got a 5K raise, which felt very unfair from like a female standpoint because he was a dude. Um, And I was like, all right, I'm going to go get an offer someplace else at a big corporate for a lot more money. And at the time, I got the offer and I told Aviva, and she's like, okay, so I've known about this for four months, but we're going to give you the CEO role. (laughs) And I was like, oh, now I have a big decision to make. Um, And that was really hard because this large corporation was going to pay me a lot of money um, and they really, really wanted me. uh, And I wasn't going to make a ton more money at NUMA. I got to take over the CEO at the time salary. Um, But it was the right choice because I was like, I want to continue to build this. I want to continue to build it. I want to continue to grow it. This is what I love doing. And so I took the CEO and managing director role. Why do you think they offered you the CEO and managing director role? I mean, I was basically already operating as a partner with Aviva. Like she, I was her right hand woman. I was, you know, our top salesperson in the company as well. And, um, you know, she's also a big promoter. And actually, that's what she does now is promoting female leadership. Mm. And so she did a lot of advocating for me to the board in Paris 
uh, to have me step into that role because I was ready for it. And I, it was what I loved, what I was passionate about. And I was positioned to then continue to build that out. Mm. And tell us a little bit about your leadership team. Yeah, so all females. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, Julia, my uh, program director, she's from Italy. She's absolutely fantastic. We have um, Shai as well, who runs um, a lot of our programs alongside Julia. We've been doing a lot of programs lately with like governments, et cetera. So like all of our leadership at least is female. And why do you think that that's so important? I don't know. I feel like it's really unfair. I keep just hiring females, but they just happen to be better for the roles. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a very good answer, I think. I think. Um, no, I think it's really important to have more perspective of not all male. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I also like being able to then support other female leadership to continue to grow as well, because I think it's important. Like women can do incredible things. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's a small company, but I think that like, from the work that we do and, and all of the stuff that we do super, super well, uh, it's just hopefully breaking down some biases that people have about females and leadership. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to also go back to the offer that you got for $5,000 more compared to the male who got to write his own ticket. Um, yeah. Share with us that experience. One, maybe uh, how it made you feel, if you'd like to get into that. But also, two, just to describe the the biases that happen in that in that world. Yeah. Um, because I think that uh, we are not as educated as to what's really happening, um, and 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 myself included. Yeah. I, I you know from from where I come from and and the corporate environment that I see, I'm like, well, I get paid this, and I know my counterpart who's a female gets paid the same amount as me or whatever. Yeah. But in your industry, there's a little bit more, especially in the tech and startup and entrepreneurial wor- world, there's a little bit of a gray area there. So I'm interested to hear uh, from your perspective that. Yeah, it's, it, I was so and enlighten angry. us. I was so angry. I was furious. And at the time, you know, the managing director is one of the things she said to me, she was like, well, well, he was making more money than I'm making. I'm like, how does that make it any better? (laughs) Like, he is a position lower than you. And like, what? It makes no sense. Um, So I was very, very frustrated, but it happens a lot. And there's a lot of, like, I mean, technology, there's a lot of initiatives for that to get better um, and have more women in, like, positions of leadership, et cetera. But it still doesn't happen in a lot of companies. And even in, like, venture capital, like, there are way too many like white men in all of the VCs, Mm -hmm. like pages, you just see white man after white man. And there's not a lot of like female or people of color uh, VC funds. And that creates bias when you're investing in entrepreneurs as well. Like females do not get funded as often as men do because of biases. Um, Also like women of color and people of color don't get funded as often as they should because all of the venture capitalists are white men. So actually one of the things that's in our roadmap right now is to start raising a venture capital fund so that we can invest in entrepreneurs directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and, um, you answered my question, my next question, which was gonna be why is it important? And and that's why it's important, is that by having that diversity, and we, from at least from what I've learned, is that it's, it's, something that is trying to, we're trying to change something that's been going on for so long. Yeah. And some of it is legacy. It's because this, like you said, uh, old white man uh, was a lawyer uh, yeah. maybe many years ago and his and generational and his grandson and his great grandson and and here they are today. And yeah. so there, there's some generational things that happen. And so um, they, they have that role. But, but changing that is very important because yeah. um, I remember the story of uh, Sarah Blakely and Spanx and pitching to VCs and the VC going, why would anybody buy pantyhose or, or leggings? Because they don't understand. <laughs> they don't understand. But like a female VC would totally get that, right? Like it's just different, <laughs> right? And, different backgrounds. And so it's really important because, um, and then as we'll talk about with some of the startups that you work with, is that your your startups and your entrepreneurs in, in this tech world are trying to solve for things that most of us aren't aware of. Mm-hmm. And so when we think about... Um, the, the different cultures and the minorities and the different groups that are out there that are getting overlooked, they're trying to solve for something to help either something in their environment or their group or even for the greater good. Yeah. And and we're not we're missing the boat on that. 
Yep. You're missing really fantastic people and ideas when you're when, you know, these types of things are are going on in terms of equality. So back to NUMA and how you're changing that. And I, I'd like to hear more about how you're changing that, obviously, through your culture. And and culture is very important to you. You spoke about it with your ex-husband's company, that his culture from his company stood out to you. And that was really important. Being collaborative is very important to you. You talk about it with managing your teams yeah. about culture. And uh, you could dig dive into all of that after this question, but how how is NUMA changing that industry? Obviously, like I said, through your culture, but how is it changing with all of the accelerators that are, com- uh, the, the, the tech companies that are coming through your accelerator program? Yeah. So we work with all international entrepreneurs. So we get a large diversity of companies coming from ecosystems that oftentimes don't have as many opportunities. Like for example, like where we've done like big programs with like Mexico to support Mexican entrepreneurs and growing their business. We're doing programs right now with Ukraine, uh, Costa Rica. Um, You know, we try as much as possible to also with our networks create, you know, gender and diversity uh, on everything that we do. When we run corporate programs and we have panels, we're looking to have, you know, make sure that we have diversity there with people of color, with um, women. We want gender parity as much as possible on all of our speaking opportunities uh, so that we're elevating more voices that aren't just the norm in tech and just the people that will, you know, say yes to doing interviews and things like that because it's it's much harder. It takes more work as an organization to make sure they're being mindful of those things. But it's so important because as an ecosystem, and a platform that's supporting these entrepreneurs, having this large community, having, you know, people that are watching what we're doing, that are supporting, that are, you know, listening to our network of speakers. It's so important that we're we're being really mindful and thoughtful of that and making sure that we're we're elevating voices that that need to be voice and expertise that should be elevated. Mm-hmm. And you have a, a really large network uh, of entrepreneurs and mentors. Mm-hmm. I'd like to hear a little bit more about these mentors and that relationship that you have, something like over 250 uh, mentors in your network. Yeah, yeah. And even more that we can call on that maybe aren't official mentors, but will always jump in to help our startups. Um, so like, I feel like I'm in the business of collecting people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I have incredible humans. And it's the thing that like I love most about what we do is that there's always so many ways to engage different relationships in with our startups because we are industry agnostic. We work across technology industries. And so um, we have mentors that are high up in big corporations that are maybe, um, you know, maybe in corporate venture arms that are looking to find startups or are in innovation roles that need to connect with external partnerships with startups. We have venture capitalists that are looking for startups and specific specific industries to invest in. Uh, We have like skills based experts in things like sales and marketing and um, legal experts that can support the startups with understanding how to do U.S. market entry. And so literally everything I'm doing and my team is doing, a lot of it is very based on building relationships with people that are willing and excited to help and support my network and then also my startups. Mm-hmm. And so speak a little bit about the relationship between the uh, startup, the the entrepreneur in, in that moment and their relationship with the mentor. And the, the, the behind the scenes of the question there is more of like speaking to our entrepreneurs that are listening today of how they may be able to seek out a mentor or also if they have one, how they could better that relationship and get more out of that relationship to be more successful. Yeah, that's a lot of what we're coaching our startups on is like literally how to take the most advantage of those relationships that we're introducing them to in the program. Um, But one of the things I think a lot of entrepreneurs think that they need to do is talk about their company as if it's like the best thing ever and everything's perfect. Don't do that. Mentors are excited by like dirt. Bring your dirt is what we tell the startups all the time because mentors can't help you if they don't know what your challenges are. And so this is another place where self-awareness really comes in. It's like if you as a founder, and these are the founders, like it's a thing that I look for when we're actually interviewing founders for our program is like, how self-aware are they? Like, do they only talk about how great their company is and how great they're doing? Because if so, I'm going to be on the interview with them and be like, all right, I don't think we can help you. And they're like, wait, 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 no, no, no. These are all my problems. I'm like, great, good. That's what <laughs> we we need. Because like, I need to know what your challenges are to help you. And so for all of the mentors, they are there to help you. They're there to share their expertise. Um, but 
you need to be able to share your problems and what you don't know first. And having that vulnerability and that awareness mm. is actually how to engage best with mentors. And the other thing is like, if you're just looking for mentors, I always tell people never, like I have personal mentors. I don't think I've ever told them that they're my personal mentors or that we've ever explicitly said that. But instead, I come to them with challenges. Um, they're people that I respect. Um, I have never made an ask like, hey, will you be my mentor? But I'll say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going through this challenge right now with the business and I was wondering if you'd have 30 or 45 minutes to get on a call with me this week to because I'd love to get your advice and your opinion on it. And they will always hop on a call with me. So it's like very much like problem first uh, approach to mm. mentorship. Mm, yeah. And because those relationships and Simon Sinek, I, I learned a lot from him in terms of the, the mentorship relationship is they want to give. Yeah. Uh, part of part of your relationship with them is that they're 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 thinking the same way that you think. And they want to give back to you as well. And so when you're asking them and sharing your problem with them, you're you're exciting them because they're going, oh, wow, I get to use some of the knowledge I have and share it with yep. you. And that's what they want to do. And and if they don't want to do that with you, then they're probably not somebody you should keep in your phone very much longer. No, right? exactly. Like, and, and, and sometimes people are too busy and that happens and whatever. But yeah. like if if you're not – so exactly. They want to help. They right. want to support. Um, and then also be – like follow up as well. And then also in the mentor conversations, the thing, another thing we always tell our startups to do is see if there's ways that you can provide value to them. Yeah. Because giving back as well is super important. And sometimes, and like a lot of times people, especially that are kind of navigating or early in their careers are like, but I don't have anything of value to give. And it's like, even if you can identify another person or a book or a resource mm -hmm. that could be helpful for them or like introduce them to a person that could be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to do to provide value. Right. Um, and it's really easy and it doesn't necessarily mean that like you have to share advice with them or know more than them, et cetera. But it's also a really important part in building long-term relationships with mentors. And I also think that that's also part of how you build your network yeah. is uh, by introducing people. And what you just said there is so perfect because I, I say that so often as well. It's, it's just so simple to introduce people. Yeah. You don't have to know anything about either one of their industries. You don't have to be in any position of power or whatever it is that you're thinking. All you have to do is say, a, meet B, B, meet B, A, A and this is why. Yep. And here's how you could help each other. Enjoy. Yep. A and that's it. And you, you've you provided some sort of value. Of course, you want to introduce people for a reason. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but it, like you said, it's going to help with the mentor relationship, but also it expands your network because yep. now you've just presented value just to one person where, oh, I, I can connect with this person. Yep. Always think I, about value creation. I think that that's great. Um, part of what you just talked about there, uh, you, there's a couple things that I'm very interested in, but I think that they do go into this, which you mentioned mindset. So I'm very interested into your mindset and the mindset that you expect from others. And so speaking of others, you do something called a 360 evaluation with your team. Yeah. I'd love to hear about that evaluation, what it is, and the impact it has on your team and on your on your culture and yeah. how you, your community. Yeah, I love the Team 360. We just did it recently, and it always just feels like it's like cathartic. Um, so basically, what we do is we have a feedback culture anyway, and so like we're always giving sort of iterative feedback. We don't necessarily wait for performance points to give feedback. It's a big thing that I'm a proponent of. But we do do once a quarter more formal feedback in the form of a 360. And so what we'll do is the whole team meets minus one person and we share collectively uh, what we think that person's who's missing strengths are. What are the things they're doing really well? What have they improved on? Have we seen improvement on since the last 360? And then where are the opportunities for growth? And what are the things that if they were to improve on these things would take it to the next level? Inside of that, there are like rules, like it has to be done in a caring way, which is one of our internal team values is like the most important is that we care. And it it is really seen as we're giving this person a gift. Everything that's shared, both positive and negative, uh, has to have context around it. So there needs to be examples. There needs to be factual instances, things that people have actually noticed so that the person receiving the feedback can actually contextualize when they've done these certain behaviors or both good and, you know, areas for growth. Um, and then once we've done that, and it's very time consuming because we have a 30 minute meeting for every person on the team. So it takes like <laughs> six or seven hours of just preparation time. And then um, at the end, we then have a long like three or four hour meeting 
or back when we were used to be in person, we'd go to like lunch and set up at a cafe all day. And we actually share the feedback collectively together. Um, and so I will go through all of the things for each person. Each person has an opportunity to also self-reflect and share the things they think they're doing well and the things that they think they need to improve on. Um, and then we give the feedback. And then afterwards, the person can respond. It's usually a thank you and like, I agree with these things or can I have more context on this one that you said? And then everybody walks away feeling amazing. It's like taking a shower because we all feel really clear on uh, it builds trust. We know what we need to all work on. And it's just like such it, it's my favorite one of my favorite things that we do as a culture and our team to like continue to grow and improve and, and work. Mm. And I, I love that you said it builds trust because that's exactly what I was thinking. It, it gets rid of all of that internal politicking yeah. of talking behind people's backs or passive aggressive behaviors because you're actually able to say, you know what, I don't like it when they do that. And I'm going to be able to to share that. Yeah. The other thing that I think that it, it brings and, and you could speak to is a lot of awareness. And so we talked about a lot about self-awareness, but I also think a lot of awareness as to what's going on in my environment, what's other people doing, how are they doing it, what's working, what's not working, and being very aware of, of their job. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it gives them awareness of like their their colleagues as well. Um, it, it is a really important thing. And, and it's interesting too, because when people do the self-reflection, I, it's actually kind of one of my favorite parts to see then what are the differences between the self-reflection and, and what the team sees. And it's usually not very surprising. Most of the time, people will call out in themselves the things that we are also calling out mm. and bringing attention to in the feedback. And so you're hiring people that are very self-aware as well. So what, Oh, yeah. Is... That's like one of the things that I always try to do. It's never perfect, but like yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to work with self-aware people. Oh, don't worry. We won't get into your hiring. We won't give away all your secrets. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, Ray Dalio? No. Uh, Ray Dalio, a uh, tremendous investor. I, I've only heard of him recently, so don't worry. Okay. But, but any, there, are, there are some people that would probably look at us like we're crazy because he's been around for a very long time. Uh, tremendous investor. And um, he, he created a, uh, a platform for his team to be able to, on the fly, like while the meeting's going on, rate. Um, the the speaker, the person who's speaking, the, the rate himself as the CEO, rate wow. everybody and put them into different buckets. Um, I'm not explaining it exactly how it is, but yep. you could definitely find it on YouTube. He talks about it in some of his TED Talks and other things just uh, very similar to what you're talking about, the 360, yep. where it evaluates were were they effective in in what they were sharing? Um, you know, did it was it impactful? Um, you know, all these different things that are are very important because, like for Ray, for instance, who's the the CEO and like I said, you know, just a tremendous personality. It's important for him to get that feedback from his team to not just be looked at as, well, he's a CEO and I can't say that about him. But it's very important for him because he needs that feedback so he could communicate with them. Yeah. Because even yourself, right? You're in a position where someone might be afraid to tell you something. And so it's yep. very and then and then that hurts you. Yep. Because that that creates a blind spot for you to where now you can't help them or you can't improve as a CEO, right? And when we coach managers, like all the time, a lot of them, one of the challenges that they have when we're talking about feedback is getting feedback from their teams, <laughs> which takes a lot of trust because mm -hmm. em employees are afraid to give feedback to their managers. But right. like, I need that feedback so that I can improve and continue to be a better manager mm -hmm. and better serve my team. And so... Like, my team is not afraid to give me feedback. <laughs> They're very direct and honest with me, and I really, really appreciate it. And I think also some some points that I want to make to that and, and that you could definitely add to it if you'd like is it's re done respectfully. Yes. It's done with care. And then a big key to it that I felt from when you were explaining it is that it's done with context. Yeah. It's not just saying... I don't like when you do this. It's yep. done with context of here's the situation and I'm assuming that you're probably having this context of of here's how you can maybe do it better, some yep. suggestions. Next step, also the impact, right? Because like sometimes it's a, there, any behavior can have two sides of a coin. Like for example, my program director, she is fantastic. She's awesome. She's a powerhouse. She works super hard. She got COVID twice and like worked through it both times. Wow. And I could not get her to take sick time off like could not get her to do it and so even in my the last 360 one of my feedbacks to her was when you don't take time off when you're sick or things like that it sets an example and, and you're super hardworking mm. and you're super accountable which is great things but it sets an example for the team where if they got sick they might not feel comfortable taking off right and feel like their expectation is for them to work through it and i don't want 
we shouldn't be setting that expectation for the team. And so like while I recognize that you're so hardworking, that is the impact it has on the team. And that's the negative impact mm-hmm. of those traits. And so like we need to make sure that like if you're sick, take a day off. Like, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And I, I forget who it was, but another female entrepreneur who um, was working through her pregnancy. And that was I forget the, the her story and, and who she is. And, and, and I'm sorry for that. But uh, she, she did speak about that, the impact that if I'm working through my pregnancy, then another female who gets pregnant is not going to feel comfortable to take time off. So I have to take time off. Yep. And I have to stop. Yep. And and that goes to males too, and everything is is just leading by example. Yeah, right? leading by example is that they're going to follow your example, and if yep. your example is to do that, then exactly. And that's the impact of it. So it's like kind of like it's like the context, it's the impact, and it's sort of like what are the next steps? And sometimes we don't know how the person can improve on certain things, and we'll say that. But a lot of times, like the next steps are the suggestions or the things that we'd like to see that they could do better. Um. So impact is huge, and there's something that you're also doing to impact the world in, in more than just being an accelerator program and helping all of these tech companies uh, build their dreams, but you're also working with other companies to be able to do great for the world, and I'd like to hear a little bit about that before we, we wrap up and some of the, the initiatives that you guys have, have been a part of. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we are, we've done and that we hope to do more of, we've just been so crazy lately, Um, is actually like do more mentorship with other organizations that have, you know, people that are a part of them that, you know, maybe don't have as much access to opportunities. So we work with a um, organization in New York that supports a lot of um, like displaced um, refugees Mm -hmm. uh, that are looking to have opportunities here. And my team and myself have done like a lot of mentorship hours. Like I just love helping people with their careers. Cause like that's sort of where I came from with my transition and to be able to like continue to support those types of organizations, like is very exciting and something our team really enjoys and loves to do. Yeah. That's definitely something that I've picked up from you from the very beginning of our interview and some of your bio of even being a music teacher that you've always had this. And, and when you mentioned your, your story of, of your childhood and growing up, you've always had this like desire to be around people and to help people and to be a part of people. And so it's just so fitting that the position that you're in and, and the environment that you work in and then to do that, that good for others. Uh, so here's your, your last hard question to, to navigate okay. through. And uh, I'm still working on on how I want to phrase it. So it's kind of like twofold and you could decide which way you want to go with it, <laughs> which is uh, if you can go back and, and if there was something in your history, whatever it is, that you could change, of course, one that might be uh, beneficial to our entrepreneurs and business leaders and, and helping them. But if you can go back and, and make a change uh, or do something differently, uh, what might it be? Or the other way to, to approach this question is um, maybe look at that challenge and maybe what did you learn from it? Hmm. Gosh, that's a hard question because I actually really try hard to not ever live in regret. Because that's wonderful. Because literally everything that has ever happened to me or that I've ever done or any crazy decision that I've made has led me exactly to where I am now. And I don't know that I would have done it any differently because you are who you are in those moments where you make those decisions and you make those decisions. Um so that's a really tough one to answer. And so that's where the second part to the question comes in to yeah. save you, because I agree with you on that, by the way, that that is my philosophy is that everything uh, I, I don't like. I, I personally don't like everything happens for a reason, uh, but I do believe that it's part of our story. Mm. Everything that happens to us is part of our story and yeah. is there for a reason or or taught us something. And so maybe there's something that in your history that taught you something that you can look at today and go, you know what? I learned a lot from that experience. It wasn't great, but I learned a lot from it. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been tons of those. I think even like recently, I think the moments that I I do regret the most are the moments where I make decisions in fear. Mm. Um, and I usually do eventually work through the fear, but it sometimes delays progress or delays things. So like one of the recent things, so I'm actually in the process and it's been approved by the board so I can talk about it even though not all the papers are signed but I'm actually acquiring the subsidiary Numa New York from the parent company in Paris so myself and our program director will actually be owners now of the business won't just be the figureheads running it 
Um, wow. Which is very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm very excited. However, we have an exclusive here. This should have happened already um, because a lot of it was my own fear in delaying this process, in mm. speaking up to Paris that, like, I didn't necessarily think that, you know, while I love their mission and what they're doing, that it's the right time right now for our office to take kind of the new direction that Paris has been going in with New York. And so I, you know, and once I did, share my perspective with the board it was like okay well let's think about it how about you buy the company and i was like oh that would have been an option and if i had done that like i mean i could have done that a year ago i spent a year trying to push forward with initiatives that they had that weren't necessarily working because it's not the right timing for those initiatives in the company for the u.s market almost like as if they were one of my startups coming through the program Mm -hmm. um but i let fear I let fear kind of take the seat. And I think that is a theme in my life is like whenever I do move through the fear and do the things that scare me, it always comes out better. And I, you know, it, it, it's working out, but I wasted a year. Well, I wouldn't say you wasted a year because like you sure. and I agree, <laughs> like you and I agree, you definitely learned from it. Uh, but what I would what I would add to that, um, and, and I'm sure you agree with, and from what I've heard from so many different entrepreneurs that have come through here, um, is that it's very important as a leader to make a decision yeah. and to make that decision sometimes quickly. And maybe that's what you're you're referring to is that you could have made that decision a year ago. And it was something my team was asking for in the 360s. They wow. were saying to me, they were like, we need more direction. Like we are doing, the company is doing two different things and we don't know where we're going. And that's your job, Francis. And I'm like, oh, you're so right. Oh my um, goodness. And so, and that's one of the things, like I'm so glad my team gives me feedback because that became then, my personal thing to work on was like figuring out what was the direction and how to navigate those waters. Now, would you think though, uh, because you did talk about COVID and how that changed your business, do you think that maybe it was also a blessing that you didn't buy it a year ago because of what you experienced during COVID where I I love the way you you put this in your bio of like gravity. I I, I don't even want to steal it from you. I kind of want, if you remember it, I love it. Gravity (laughs) and air. I love this analogy. Yeah, because I, I, I have a lot of confidence that like, I'm very solutions oriented and I'm like, I know how to solve problems. So any problem that comes my way, I'll be able to figure out a solution. But then like when COVID hit, I was like, wait a minute, I know how to solve problems on earth where I understand what gravity feels like and what oxygen is like. And I was suddenly placed on the moon when I no longer knew what gravity was like or oxygen. And how am I supposed to solve problems here? And so that's what it felt like. And it was, it was really hard. And I'm sure that that actually played a lot into my own fears at the time because Everything in the world felt unstable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it would have been hard at that moment to push forward. For me, my biggest concern then was like, how do I get my team through this crisis? How do we adapt so that we can continue to provide value in ways that allow us to still make money (laughs) and pay everybody's salary? Right. (laughs) I, I really love that analogy. And so many, so many, and you know this, so many people experienced it. I mean, you even talked about it where... Uh, your company was supposed to grow in 2020 and and it kind of stayed the same. And, and so many companies were like that. And, and unfortunately, some went down because yeah. of it. So I think that your decision uh, and timing is right where it needs to be. Yes. And, and you made the right decision. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Francis, could you share with us any um, uh, emails or um, ways to contact your team yeah. um, and also the website? This will, of course, be in the show notes. Uh, but just for anybody listening, if you want to get in touch right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can feel free to send me an email. Uh, my email is Francis, F-R-A-N-C-E-S dot S at NUMA, N-U-M-A dot C-O. Um, happy to answer emails. Oh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, and it's with an E-S for Francis. Actually, I love that. We're talking about gender, when people email me thinking I'm a man, they're like, dear Mr. Simowitz. And I'm like, <laughs> you'll be surprised when we're on the Zoom call. Um, <laughs> but yeah, happy to chat with anybody. If you have questions or thoughts or looking for advice for your own career or startup, happy to help. And quick, uh, the, the mission of, of NUMA real quick, just so that people understand exactly what NUMA does, because we have said it's an accelerator program, but maybe just... Um, yeah, and there will be a new name soon, by the way. Ah. We're rebranding with the acquisition. So, okay. But NUMA, our, our mission is to support international entrepreneurs and leaders with uh, resources and access to the U.S. market. Pretty much get them from their idea to launch to being able to pitch and sell. Yep, pretty much. Right? Yep. We work with entrepreneurs 
all over the world. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's been so such a great experience having you on today. As we talked about before we came on, I have to have you on again. Um, <laughs> I had, I'm looking at the time and I'm just like, I got to get you out of here for, for your own sake. Um, <laughs> that was uh, fun. I um, loved this. But um, I, I, would, I definitely would love to have you on again. I think there were so many th- different things about you and your business and also being a female entrepreneur and what's happening in that world uh, is so important for us to share with our audience uh, that I would just love to have you on again. I'd love to come back. Well, thanks so much for being on. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Michael Esposito Show. For show notes, video clips, and more episodes, go to michaelespositoinc.com backslash podcast.